Good morning. Good morning. This is a beautiful Bauhausian day. Form, nature, all in sync, and glorious communion. Just when you thought that Linda and Stuart Resnick could give us no more, they've given us this beautiful catalog right before you, and it's for you to take, and it was actually produced in-house at the wonderful company. It is gorgeous, and it's a work of scholarship. Bernard Jazar, where's Bernard? The curator who actually produced this. Walter Gropius was trying to find the right way to express disruption, to give form and meaning to a whole new vision and a whole new way of thinking about a new school of thought. And he wrote in 1919 a beautiful, resounding manifesto. It's called the Manifesto of Salika. And I want to read it to you with the same power and the same vision that he was trying to inspire in trying to create the necessary tension for a new way and a new dynamic thought. This is what he wrote. The ultimate goal of art is the building. The ornamentation of the building was once the main purpose of the visual arts, and they were considered indispensable parts of the great building. Today they exist in complacent isolation, from which they can only be salvaged by the purposeful and cooperative endeavors of all artisans. Architects, painters, and sculptors must learn a new way of seeing and understanding the composite character of the building, both as a totality and in terms of its parts. Their work will then re-imbue life itself with the spirit of architecture, which is lost in salon art. The art schools of old were incapable of producing this unity, and how could they? For art may not be taught. They must return to the workshop. This world of mere drawing and painting of draftsmen and applied artists must at long last become a world that builds. When a young person who senses within himself a love for creative endeavors began his career, as in the past, by learning a trade, the unproductive artist will no longer be condemned to the imperfect practice of art because his skills is now preserved in craftsmanship where he may achieve excellence. Architects, sculptors, painters, we all must return to the craftsmanship for there is no such thing as art by profession. There is no essential difference between the artist and the artisan. The artist is an exalted artisan. Merciful heaven in rare moments of illumination beyond man's will may allow art to blossom from the very work of his hand. But the foundations of proficiency are indispensable to every artist. This is the original source of creative design. So let us therefore create a new guild of craftsmen free of the divisive class pretensions that endeavor to raise a prideful barrier between craftsmen and artists. Let us strive for a cooperative, conceive and create the new building of the future that will unite every discipline, architecture and sculpture and painting, and which will one day rise heavenward from the millions of hands of craftsmen as a clear symbol of a new belief to come. If that is not a thought that should inspire us to think new and creatively, there is no thought to think. And perhaps the best way to begin this morning with that thought and reflection is to introduce Dietrich Neumann, who is going to speak to us about Germany 1919, the birth of the Bauhaus. Thank you, Eric. That was such a beautiful rendering of that uh, famous document that I will briefly quote again at the end of my uh, talk. Uh, good morning, first of all. I'm glad to be here. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about the Bauhaus since I arrived. And I'll make some references uh, to ASM in particular as we go along. Uh, 
When Jonathan Westgard uh, sent me an email a while back and um, asked me to give this lecture, it sounded very easy. He said, talk about one year, the year 1919 in general and the beginnings of the Bauhaus in particular. I said, sure, I would love to do that. The more I worked on the talk, the more I discovered what I had gotten myself into. The year 1919 was one of the, perhaps the most chaotic year in modern German history. Not only that, it was also the year in which events happened and coincided that decidedly shaped the rest of the century and in fact shaped the world we live in today. So what I will try to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to give you some ideas of the political and cultural scene in Germany and Central Europe during that fateful year of 1919 and show how the founding of the Bauhaus was one of the many events that emerged from that chaos and left decisive traces that are still palpable today. And you will see that the beginnings of the most important, most influential art school of the 20th century were astonishingly accidental and chaotic themselves. Many of you, of course, are familiar with the Bauhaus building in Dessau of 1926 with Herbert Byers, beautiful typography on the side, which of course also adorns our building these days here. And uh, of course, you've seen many of the Bauhaus products and you've heard about the influence that this uh, remarkable school had on architecture, on design, typography, theater, furniture, etc., etc. We'll get to this in the next few days, of course. The, school beginnings, uh, the school's beginnings in the year 1919, however, were in an existing building in the city of Weimar. One can only understand the sectarian, secretive, mystical and mystifying, occult and obscure tendencies of those early years if one looks at its time. It was founded merely five months after World War I had ended, the most devastating of all wars to date. If you ask historians to describe the First World War, which lasted from 1914 to 1918, with just one single word, what you get as a response is cataclysmic, catastrophic, transformational, destructive, a huge mistake, one historian would, uh, told uh, me as I saw, simply a stupid war. Indeed, it could have been easily avoided. It came down to lack of communication, vanity, pride, intellectual rigidity, pent-up prejudice, a simple falling of dominoes that never needed to fall. There was no noble cause that people fought for. Millions died in the mud and blood of the trenches. There were tanks, artillery guns, machine guns, chemical warfare, aerial warfare. In some ways, it was also the beginning of the modern era. The tragedy, um, well, let's go back here. Uh, the sort of tragedy becomes even more palpable when one looks at how well things seemed to be going in the years just before 1914. The German Reich had been united, had been at peace since its victory over France in 1871 and the Franco-Prussian War. At the end of that war, and Chancellor uh, Otto von Bismarck in the white uh, uniform in the center had managed to bring all the German-speaking uh, countries together, a dream that had existed for a long time, and founded the German Reich. And uh, there was prosperity, industrialization, enormous growth, uh, growth of cities, growth of industry, interesting new architecture, new social laws, breathtaking uh, breakthroughs in medicine, in science, in technology. All now, if we look back at these images of Berlin, uh, just on the eve of World War I, seems sort of like a distant dream, these sort of peaceful moments here, all of this shattered in this senseless war uh, that uh, happened shortly afterwards. All these images here that I put together look really like postcards from a different era. Uh, Great ships were crossing the Atlantic. There were Zeppelins that the Germans had developed. Aircraft had begun to fly. Cars were beginning to be affordable. There was wonderful art. Rich museums were uh, created in Germany. Huge railroad stations, bridges, department stores, hospitals, museums, monuments, memorials, arts and crafts schools. Things began to change when Emperor William II ascended the throne in 1888. He dismissed Chancellor Otto von Bismarck in 1890, who had united the German states into the German uh, uh, Empire and kept the peace in the following decades through a very careful balancing of European powers. Instead, the young Emperor William II steered Germany on a bellicose, what he called, new course. He was 29 years old, vain, pompous, insecure, inexperienced, 
known to be obsessed about his appearance, in particular his mustache, which you can see here. Uh, not even, you'll see another image in a second. He made countless tactless, alarming public statements without consulting his ministers beforehand. He alienated other great powers by initiating a massive army buildup. Many Germans felt that dismissing Bismarck had been a huge mistake. An enormous, almost religious cult arose to celebrate Bismarck's achievements, quite jealously watched, as you can imagine, by the uh, emperor himself. It led to an astonishing and little known phenomenon of political uh, architecture, an architecture in a way of resistance against uh, the emperor, uh, an architecture to celebrate Bismarck all over Germany. Communities financed and built so-called Bismarck Towers, more than 250, I just collected a few postcards here, all over Germany, outside of the city, as these sort of pilgrimage sites where people would go. Sometimes they would be lit with flames on the top on Bismarck's birthday. Um, in 1910, even a competition was held for a national Bismarck memorial uh, because his 100th birthday was coming around in uh, uh, 1915. And many progressive young architects took part in it, was meant to be on a prominent site on the overlooking the Rhine, far from any city. Again, this was meant to be financed not through the government, but private small-scale donations. Here's just a quick lineup of a few of the entries uh, for this enormous monument uh, to celebrate uh, Bismarck and in a way sort of resist the uh, rule of the empire, if you like. Walter Gropius, the first director of the Bauhaus, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, its last director, both contributed. They were both very young. None of them won. Mies, at least here on the right, I think slightly better perhaps uh, as a design, uh, at least made it in the uh, official uh, uh, publication for both, both of them. It was the first time that they uh, uh, participated in a, in a national major competition. Nothing was built in the end. What happened instead is quite interesting. The emperor uh, uh, opened, uh, Emperor William II opened to great fanfare this monument, the largest monument in Europe at the time. 91 meters high, in a way, Germany's first skyscraper, if you will. A monument to the Battle of the Nations near Leipzig, the decisive victory over Napoleon a hundred years ago. It faced west, defiant, grandiose, monstrous, unnecessary, a gesture of visual architectural aggression against France, just on the eve of the outbreak of the war, uh, the F First World War, and so you can already see the sort of charged up atmosphere of initiating another conflict. Just a very quick summary of uh, the way the uh, war started with the assassination of the Austrian Archduke, the follower to the throne of, uh, uh, his name was Franz Ferdinand and his wife, they were murdered in Sarajevo on June 24th, 1914 by a young Bosnian um, uh, you see him here in the uh, photograph on the bottom. It needs to be said that Bosnia had just been, a few years ago, annexed by the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and uh, this uh, um, a young assassin protested this annexation. Two days after the assassination, Austria declared war on Serbia. Russia began to mobilize. Germany supported Austria and declared war on Russia and its ally France on August 1st. On August 3rd, barely five weeks after the incident, uh, um, uh, the uh, war broke out and troops began to move westward and eastward. Much blame for this fast sequence of events was laid at the feet of the German Emperor William II, who made a number of rash and hapless decisions which laid the groundwork for the catastrophe. He was, by the way, a grandson of Queen Victoria, but nevertheless, when he wanted to invade uh, France, he marched right through Belgium, which had remained neutral and was protected by uh, contracts with, the, uh, with uh, Great Britain. So as a result, the British declared war on Germany too. So uh, uh, very quickly, the whole uh, thing escalated. The Ottoman Empire joined Germany, opening up new fronts on its long border in the Caucasus and Kuwait. Japan confiscated the German holdings in the Pacific. German colonies in Africa were confiscated by the Allied powers. Uh, the war in Russia, here's the, the map, uh, the war in Russia ended successfully for the Germans due to the Russian Revolution in 1917 and the Bolsheviks immediately signed a peace treaty. Still, 1.7 Russians lost their lives. On the Western Front, the war in the trenches lasted for years with the most horrendous losses of life, chemical warfare, traumatizing for everyone who experienced it. One of them was Walter Gropius, the future founder of the Bauhaus. He remembered once a 15-centimeter mortar grenade exploded right in front of him. He was unconscious. 
for a while, and then, as he described it, got up, oh miracle, only covered with dirt. The shock was terrible. At another occasion, he lay buried under sand and debris for several days. His captain was shot and killed right in front of him. His regiment reduced from 250 to 134. His nerves were shattered. He suffered from sleeplessness and nightmares for the rest of his life. After the United States entered the war in 1917, the tides turned. Germany finally was forced to sign an armistice in November 1918. The numbers of that war were staggering. There were about 70 million military personnel involved, 60 million in Europe alone. One of the deadliest conflicts in history, nine million combatants died. There were seven million civilian deaths as a direct result. But directly related to it were genocides and the resulting 1918 influenza pandemic that caused another 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. The armistice was immediately followed by what is called the November Revolution in Germany. The monarchy was abandoned, a parliamentary democracy established, elections set. The emperor was forced to abdicate and fled to Holland, where he lived out the rest of his life in a small castle that the Dutch royal family had offered. The Allied negotiations started almost immediately uh, in the Foreign Office in Paris. Germany was not invited, not involved, and was in the end forced to accept all demands and accept full responsibility for the war. The American president, Woodrow Wilson, played a major role in the negotiations. One of his great contributions was the idea of uh, a League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, which was founded actually uh, half a year later in January of 1920. It was the first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. As we all know, it didn't succeed in 1939. Final signing ceremonies for the uh, treaty, the peace treaty, was on June 28, 1919. Significantly, it was not held at the foreign ministry where the negotiations uh, had taken place, but for maximum humiliation at the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. Here you see that Hall of Mirrors. Of course, it was payback time. It was the same Hall of Mirrors at the palace where the Germans had celebrated in 1871 their victory in the Franco-Prussian War and the German unification. If we actually look, there's a, this wonderful painting here by William Orpen. If we look at a close-up there, you'll see the German delegate, Johannes Bell, signing the document, slumped in his seat. You can barely see him. And then above him, Woodrow Wilson, Georges Clemenceau, David Lloyd, Lloyd George, and Hermann Müller on the German uh, uh, side. The Germans lost a big amount of its territory at home, all of its colonies in Africa and Asia. It had to agree to reparation payments for the next 60 years, and it had to take full responsibility for the outbreak of the war. The emperor was declared a war criminal and had to be extradited. The Netherlands, however, who had granted him asylum, never complied, and he lived out his life on that estate of Dorn that I showed you. The treaty was considered catastrophic by many unfair and humiliating, and humiliating by a vast majority of Germans. Even some on the commission, it should be said, thought it wasn't a good idea to cripple the German economy for the foreseeable future. John Maynard Keynes, famous economist, for instance, withdrew under protest and wrote a famous book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, published in 1919. He said that the treaty reduced Germany to servitude for a generation and deprived a whole nation of happiness. He predicted that the result, and I quote, would be a final war between the forces of reaction and the departing convulsions of revolution before which the horrors of the late German war will fade into nothing. And of course, he was right. The Second World War is by most historians seen and understood as a direct result of the end of the first. You see how the landscape had changed. Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire are dismantled. New separate countries are created. While all of this was playing out, there was, and of course, Germany lost a, a big chunk of its territory. While all of this was playing out, there was incredible turmoil in the streets of Berlin. The Russian Revolution had sparked fascination and seemed to hold great promise. A good number of Germans wanted to follow this model. It seemed for a moment as if war had come to the streets of Berlin. In fact, both in Berlin and Munich, a, social re a socialist republic was officially announced, but several of its proponents then quickly and brutally murdered by right-wing militias. Here an image from images from a Spartacist uprising in Berlin in January 1919. Despite the declarations of wanting to be apolitical, both Walter Gropius, the first director of the Bauhaus, and Mies van der Rohe, the last director, designed memorials 
uh, in this context. Gropius for striking workers in Weimar who had been shot in 1922. Mies, a little later, for Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, who had founded the Communist Party and been murdered shortly afterwards by right-wing militias. Oh, sorry. On January 19th, 1919, the first free and open democratic elections happened in Germany. Women were allowed to vote, to run as candidates for the first time. Soldiers were allowed to vote. And young people, the voting age was lowered uh, uh, from 25 to 20. So the number of people who could vote almost doubled. And you see here a big chunk of the sort of social democrats here, the SPD on the left, uh, in fact, carried the day. The parliament decided to escape the unrest in the streets of Berlin and move to a quiet city, three hours south of Berlin, Weimar. This was a smart and deliberate choice. It sent a signal in two directions. Mindful of the negotiations going on in Paris at the same time, it made sense to choose this particular city. Weimar signaled the home of the peace-loving liberal German classic, the home of the famous writers Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and Friedrich Schiller, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, composers Franz Liszt, and Johann Sebastian Bach. It has kept its charm to this very day. This is a contemporary view, but it looks exactly like it did uh, in uh, uh, 1919. Here's another image. This is a lovely market uh, square with that neo-Gothic uh, town hall. Uh, so it's uh, just very much worth uh, a visit. At the same time, it signaled to the German states that the new government was not dominated by Berlin and Prussia. The newly elected parliamentarians met in the state theater in Weimar, which had been built 12 years earlier. And if you look closely, you see Schiller and Goethe holding hands right in front of it. So it sent the right signal. When we look inside, we see the arrangement, the stage converted to a speaker's plenum. And looking closer, uh, we see women for the first time uh, among the parliamentarians. Here, I picked out a few that I could decipher there. So that's a very important, very important contribution, of course. Now back to the founding of the Bauhaus in this city at exactly that moment. So imagine these students come to the Bauhaus and they're surrounded by parliamentarians and their black cars coming in all the time to hold their meetings. They went on for a year until the Constitution was ratified. So this is all happening at exactly that moment. There were two schools in Weimar, both buildings designed by the Belgian Henry van der Velde, a prominent and charismatic painter, interior designer, and architect, although he never trained as such. He had been one of the founders of the Art Nouveau movement, but had also written perceptively on function and structure. He had founded and led the Arts and Crafts School for the local Grand Duke and designed it and the adjacent art school. He had to leave the country when the war broke out as an enemy alien and recommended Walter Gropius as his successor. Why Gropius? I want to explore that for a moment. Gropius' career had, as an architect had begun rather inauspicious. He studied one semester in Munich at my alma mater, Technical University, and perhaps one or two in Berlin, but broke off his studies both times. He wrote to his mother on June 16th, 1906. I get up at 8 o'clock, eat breakfast, and then work with my draftsmen straight through until 3.30. I've also had some projects assigned to me at the university, and I go there regularly in the afternoon. Now imagine that. He's a student at the university. He's 23 years old and already employed his own draftsmen. Reason was not that he was incredibly wealthy, but that he was just simply unable to draw a single line. <laughs> Here he writes again to his mother a few months later, October 1907. My absolute inability to bring even the simplest design to paper is casting a shadow on many otherwise beautiful things and often makes me worry about my future profession. I'm not capable of drawing a straight line. I could draw much better as a 12-year-old. It seems to be almost a physical inability for me because I immediately get a cramp in my hand and continually break the points of my pencils so that I have to rest after five minutes. Even my handwriting is the same. It gets worse every day. In my darkest hour, I had never feared that things could be so hopeless. One should think that someone who is planning to become an orchestra musician and fails already at learning an instrument would look for a different profession, but not Gropius. He would never draw, but always have devoted pupils and collaborators who would translate his ideas that he only described in words into drawings. He did give up his studies, though. He never finished architecture school and instead went on a long trip to Spain. He saw the Sagrada Familia and became enamored with Gothic architecture. He went there, and it must have looked similar to this. It was uh, Gaudí 
uh, uh, was still around. Um, he tried to meet him, but he didn't succeed. But he saw this uh, building that I'm sure many of you have seen, now almost finished, of course, uh, in Barcelona. And he fell in love with Gothic architecture and, in a way, invigorated his love for architecture on that trip. This is a famous drawing, one of the few drawings we have of Gothic architecture, the main facade of Ulm Cathedral, a 15th century drawing. And Gropius, throughout his entire life, always had a reproduction of it in his office to connect to Gothic architecture and to the art of structure. He was from a wealthy and a fairly wealthy and well-known uh, Berlin family, and so the prominent Berlin architect Peter Behrens offered him an apprenticeship. In 1910, he was let go by Behrens and started his own firm. He had made friends in Behrens' office with Adolf Meyer, a brilliant architect, and they worked together well for many years. Their first joint project was the Bismarck Memorial I briefly showed you. The next one was the stunning Fargus factory for uh, the production of shoe lass in the small town of Alfred. It's one of the most striking early modern buildings, 1913, first curtain wall, absolutely brilliant, uh, clearly a predecessor of the Bauhaus in, in its uh, design aesthetics. Wonderful building, it's now on the UNESCO list of uh, protected monuments. The next project, also with Meyer, uh, was a sample office building at an exhibition in Cologne that had been organized by the German Werkbund an important and influential organization that intended to improve German products and both craft and industrial production. It was at that exhibition that Gropius and van der Felde seems to have bonded over a famous debate, defending artistic freedom against the perceived ideas of imposed standards and quality guidelines through the Wegbund. One year later, van der Felde suggested that Gropius take over the School of Arts and Crafts he was leading in Weimar. His proposal was accepted and seems to have carried through all the changes that happened with a complete restructuring of the government in Germany that was happening on all levels, turning a monarchy into a uh, parliamentary democracy on all different levels. So all the little uh, aristocrats and fiefdoms and duke ships were gone, of course. Before I move on, I should acknowledge that in the days of the founding of the Bauhaus, Gropius had an astonishingly chaotic personal life, which must have been a huge distraction for him. Over dinner yesterday, I sat across from Stephanie I don't know if she's here, and she, and I said, you know, I'm going to leave out all that scandalous stuff about Gropius. She said, no, no, put that in. I think people want to hear that. So <laughs> I wanted to save some time, but I'll go through it very quickly. So she encouraged me. Uh, so the reason for Gropius's turmoil in his private life was this woman here on the right, Alma. She was considered one of the most beautiful women in uh, Vienna. He had married her in 1915 in the middle of the war, and they had a child together. He had known her since 1910, when she was still married to the famous Austrian composer Gustav Mahler, who was almost 20 years her senior. Gropius wanted her to leave Mahler for him, and he purposefully misdirected a steamy love letter to Almer, instead to her address, to Mahler himself. So Mahler opened it and learned about their clandestine affair. Mahler was so upset that he suffered a nervous breakdown, never finished his 10th symphony, and died a few years later. Only 51 years old. Gropius and Alma married during a brief vacation from the front, and they had a, a small daughter. On another visit home, Gropius went with Alma to an art exhibition by the famous Austrian painter Oskar Kokoschka. In this art exhibition, he looked around and suddenly I saw, he saw a self-portrait of Kokoschka with a woman who was clearly Alma. And he realized that she had been conducting an affair with Kokoschka while he was on the Western Front in the trenches. He loved her nevertheless. Another child was about to arrive, and Gropius was overjoyed. She abandoned, she abandoned Kokoschka. Another child was about to arrive. Gropius was overjoyed. Only when the little boy was born and in ill health, he didn't look like Gropius at all. He had much more similarity with the famous Austrian writer Franz Werfel, <laughs> with whom Alma had fallen in love in the meantime. Gropius and Alma were finally divorced in 1921. She came to the Bauhaus in Weimar a few times but was not very well liked there. Gropius and she remained friends, though. There are more than 850 letters throughout their lives, 
uh, have survived and are currently edited by the Bauhaus archive. Gropius had begun negotiations with the representatives uh, of the uh, uh, interim governments during the war already on visits home from the front. He had two requirements which were astonishingly granted. He wanted to combine both schools in the adjacent Van der Velde buildings, thus the existing separate Grand Ducal School of Arts and Crafts and the Grand Ducal School of Fine Arts and name them Staatliches Bauhaus. Astonishingly, both wishes were granted by the new authorities. Combining both schools promised to save a lot of money, which was scarce in the post-war period, and the new name signaled a new beginning, which made sense after the horrors of the war and the complete change of system. Of course, Gropius had to include several of the old professors in the schools that he had combined. He couldn't fire them all. They were all there. And to their credit, they all, in a faculty meeting, voted in favor of having Gropius appointed director. And just a few images. They were all very, very talented people. There's Max Tedy, a traditional painter, very, very good portrait painter. He was the head of the school uh, at that moment. There was uh, Richard Engelmann, a realistic sculptor, and Walter Klemm, all of them excellent artists, but traditional in their approach. Walter Klemm, by the way, I should mention, uh, uh, same age as Gropius, maybe may inspired by being surrounded by all this sort of uh, libertarian young students who came uh, to the Bauhaus with Gropius. He caused the first major Bauhaus scandal in 1920 when he published a book with explicit uh, erotic etchings, which were considered blasphemous. The police came in, closed the school, and tried to find all the prints of this book to uh, uh, um, get rid of. The school was uh, closed and then reopened. Now about the name Bauhaus. I think Barry said yesterday already, it's kind of a strange name, and uh, even in German, but it suggests something different from a state, state school, which was very important, something more modest in a way, similar to a Bauhütte, very similar word in German, which is uh, the German word for a Masonic lodge. Uh, by the way, something that I just found uh, uh, out and researched, uh, um, we have always assumed that Walter Gropius invented that name, but that was not the case. Instead of Gropius, the name Bauhaus was invented by a brilliant conservative Berlin architect, a man called Albert Gessner, the designer of many extremely well-designed and beautiful apartment buildings, the author of a book about them. He had a firm uh, from 1915 through 1920, which he called Bauhaus GmbH. Gropius knew Gessner. He had, uh, Gessner was in 1914 in sort of a difficult financial situation and might have invented the name to circumvent the prohibition of advertising for architects in Germany four years before the Bauhaus was uh, founded. Gropius picked up the name from him. It's one of those things that historians get excited about. I think, quite honestly, it doesn't really matter. If he invented it himself or if he picked it up from Gessner, it was a brilliant choice. There's no doubt about it. And we all love, of course, this name. Just uh, wanted to share that anyway. It excited me when I found it. Gropius was given funds to make three hires right away and was trying to have the manifesto ready for his signing of the contract on April 11th. What helped him were his contacts in a number of art organizations that he had joined. And in some, he had assumed a leading role. He was a member of the German Werkbund, which had existed before the war, and of the newly founded Arbeitsrat für Kunst, a working group for art. There was also a November group making reference to the November Revolution, and a group called the Glass Chain, uh, where uh, uh, architects sent each other uh, drawings by mail. Like Gropius, many of his colleagues were members in several of these small groups. Gropius, who had become the head uh, of this uh, organization, uh, uh, organized an exhibition for the Arbeitsrat für Kunst, about which I want to uh, talk in a moment. But one of the most important uh, men at that moment uh, was an architect called Bruno Taut. Uh, he wrote, and I think he summarizes very much what everyone was uh, thinking about and the sort of uh, emotional turmoil that uh, was there at the beginning of the Bauhaus. He wrote uh, in 1918, we are in the midst of a monstrous catastrophe in the history of the world, of a transformation of all of life and of the entire inner being. Those who experienced the war out there have come back completely changed. They see that things cannot continue in the old way. What will develop are not large intellectual organizations, but small, secret, closed associations, lodges, guilds, cabals, which preserve a secret core of belief until a general, great, productive, intellectual, and religious idea emerges from the individual groupings, an idea which must ultimately find its expression crystallized in a great total work of art. And this cathedral of the future will illuminate the smallest things of everyday life with floods of light. Bruno Taut, 1918. You will recognize immediately that this is almost verbatim the, uh, part of the text of the Bauer's Manifesto that Eric uh, 
uh, read so beautifully for us uh, at the beginning. Let me show you the, um, uh, just a few examples from that exhibition. And uh, when you look at the catalog, you might be shocked. Uh, this is one of the uh, pieces in the exhibition. You might be shocked to see a swastika on the cover of this exhibition for unknown architects. Um, uh, the swastika, of course, at that moment is still a somewhat innocent uh, symbol, geometrical figure, an ancient religious icon, symbol of divinity and spirituality in India. In the Western world, it had become a symbol of auspiciousness, good luck, until the early 1920s when it became a feature of Nazi symbolism as an emblem of Aryan identity. How important it was for Gropius to put this on the cover is proven by a small drawing of it that has survived. And we happen to know that it's by Gropius. It's here on this uh, envelope. And you see here, as far as I know, that's the only Gropius drawing that we actually do have. The two triangles, uh, he says, are the seal of Solomon. The seven stars stand for the seven virtues, love, beauty, happiness, faith, hope, and strength. And as you can see, Gropius, of course, wanted to refer to stonemason symbols, and he was intent at that moment, and I quote, on ignoring the outside world and founding small, close communities, brotherhoods, which can keep a secret. Mason's lodges, like in the golden age of the cathedrals, he wrote. He talked about wanting symbols and rituals, even a particular dress for the cultic rituals. There were very clear relations to Freemasonry. He was thinking of a secret lodge of 12 members, half of them architects, others painters, sculptors, musicians, um, poets, lovers of art. Let's look at some of the people in the exhibition. Enormous range of creativity when nothing could be built. All of them were paper architects. And I'll just show you a few examples. I love that period. It's wonderful creative uh, work is being done there. Here's a man called Wenzel Hablik. This is 1919. It's all that year that uh, uh, sort of it's abandoned with wonderful creativity. Uh, and uh, he designs these sort of dream castles up in mountaintops. Here is a man called Hermann Finsterlin, who was a sensation at that exhibition. Look at his work. Does it look vaguely familiar to you in some fashion? Right? But doesn't my, I mean, at least I look at these things and I immediately think of Frank Gehry, you know, the Guggenheim Museum. Actually had a chance to ask him about it, Finsterlin, you know, what he thought of him. He, of course, acknowledged that he knew him, but he said, no, no, his real source of influence was not Finsterlin, but Baroque sculpture, the folds and the dresses of someone like Schlüter in Berlin and others. So anyway, so there's amazing creativity going on. His uh, wonderful designs by the Lukat brothers for these central buildings, great glass cathedrals um, um, for, uh, in a way, a new religion here. Uh, another uh, image from uh, Vasily Lukart, another dream, all 1919, the Ode to Joy, reference to Beethoven. Here's Hans Sharoon, similarly part of many of these associations uh, who designed these uh, 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 gleaming, uh, light-filled cathedrals in 1919. Uh, and of course, he managed in a way to translate those drawings into built architecture. Some of you might know the Philharmonic Hall in Berlin that he did, which is clearly influenced by these early strivings. Maybe my favorite is, of course, Bruno Taut, as I mentioned. He wanted to move away from the cities which still stood for the old system, for the failed uh, politics uh, of the time, and he wanted to move into the Alps. He wrote several books in 1919. One was called The Dissolution of Cities. One was called Alpine Architecture. And uh, he describes crystalline buildings in the mountains. He wanted to illuminate mountaintops and valleys with glass buildings lit from inside. And uh, just let me show you an example here. This one, I love that here. So this is a, a mountain range in Switzerland. And he uh, writes uh, how all the f uh, tops of these snow-covered mountains are transformed into crystal cathedrals, right? And then he writes underneath, of course, the costs are enormous and uh, much sacrifice is needed, but much better than uh, using it for uh, uh, the uh, uh, greed and power and uh, um, uh, murder and desti destitution. So he obviously refers to the war and said, we spent so much money on a horrible war, we should have done something like this instead. So he wanted to transform the Alps into these gleaming crystals. And then he uh, describes these glass buildings. I absolutely love this. He, he writes, um, in Alpine architecture that comes out in 1919, you are not allowed to speak in these temples. You can always enter, even at night. Nothing that resembles a church service will be held here. These temples act only through their sublime architecture, the great uh, silence on an occasional organ or orchestra music. Um, 
these temples act only through their sublime architecture. Or from another book he did called The City Crown, where he wanted to have crystalline buildings at new, as new city centers, he wrote, the crystal house constructed from glass, the building material, infused with the light of the sun, the crystal house reigns over all like a glittering diamond which shines in the sun as a sign of the heights of pleasure and the purest peace of mind. In this room, a lonely wanderer will find the pure delight of architecture, and ascending by the steps in this room to the upper platform, he will see at his feet the, his town and behind it the sun towards which this town and its heart is so strictly directed, rising and setting. I can't emphasize enough when I read this to my students. It's a proof that the idea was really, in these quotes, that architecture would be a new religion. I absolutely love that idea as an architect myself and looking at these designs, it's fantastic. Architecture as a new uh, religion gives me always uh, much, much pleasure to uh, uh, think about it. I wanted to uh, say uh, on my first day here, I came a day early and Vivian and I went up on, uh, to the mountain top uh, to see the sun deck and there was a little model of uh, Herbert Bayer's sun deck that he built there in 1946 that they had uh, put there uh, so we could all see the building, which is gone now, is replaced by a bigger structure. But isn't that Alpine architecture? And of course he knew all these things, right, in, in Germany. This was all very much uh, knowledge uh, known. And so I feel this is his response to Bruno Taut and the ideas of, these, of this very fertile period. All right, my last uh, chapter, the founding of the Bauhaus. Gropius uh, in, in, uh, introduced new structures, of course, admitted many women. Everybody was considered. 200 students came in very quickly. Uh, it was very democratic. Students were always involved in decision making in all the councils. He actually held a competition for the new seal of the Bauhaus, won by Karl Peter Röhl. You see him here on the left. This was the official signet. Uh, and you see, once again, references to Masonic science. There's even a swastika again on the right before it lost its innocence, uh, of course, at the hand of the Nazis. And so Gropius gets to work and begins to hire uh, um, 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 masters. Uh, one is uh, um, Gerhard Marx, I'll get to in a moment. The other one is Lionel Feininger, whom he had knew from the Berlin circles in sort of expressionist uh, circles of thinkers about architecture. Um, he had started out as a, a comic strip artist in Chicago. He had been born in the uh, United States, then come to Germany and still worked for the Chicago Tribune and others as an artist. But uh, he ended up being a very good uh, expressionist artist. And he was the one who, uh, uh, in fact, uh, designed the uh, frontispiece of the Bauhaus Manifesto, in which, as you've heard, and I'll just quote this very briefly uh, uh, again, uh, Gropius sort of summarized, in a way, the mood of the time and ideas that some of his colleagues had also pronounced. He put it together, and Eric read the whole thing so beautifully. So just this brief uh, uh, excerpt. Let us then create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions that raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists. Together, let us desire, conceive, and create the new structure of the future, which will embrace architecture and sculpture and painting in one unity, and which will one day rise towards heaven from the hands of a million workers, like the crystal symbol of a new faith. Gerhard Marx was hired, and you see here how in this manifesto all these things I've pointed out uh, can be sort of traced as uh, influences that come together and that Gropius brilliantly picks up. He was very, very good at picking up the trends of the time and merging them in and producing something successful and uh, evocative and powerful and lasting, as difficult as it was. Here is uh, the sculptor uh, um, Gerhard Marx, uh, one of his first uh, three hires, finding a Marx, and the most consequential was this man here, Johannes Itten. Uh, he was uh, hired, Gropius didn't know him, he came on the recommendation, in fact, of Alma Mahler while she was still around. He, she had met him in Vienna and recommended him, and she said, he's a terrific guy, if you want to be successful with your Bauhaus, you have to hire Itten. And Gropius went to Vienna, saw an exhibition that Itten had held in his studio uh, with his and his students' drawings, and Gropius told him, according to uh, uh, Itten, he wrote to him and said, I do not understand your paintings, nor the work of your students, but if you, want, like, if you would like to come to Weimar, I would be very pleased. And so he wanted to do Alma a favor, I guess. And uh, he, uh, 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 Alma had uh, bonded with Itten over theosophic uh, literature, was very interested in anthroposophy. And uh, we can trace the evolution of his teaching. He had been a painter and an art teacher in Vienna in high school. 
um, uh, his evolution towards a broader philosophy of life. So he had his contract in hand uh, very early and is perhaps the most important legacy that Alma Mahler left at the Bauhaus. Um, he had also recently fallen under the spell of a young American religion called Mazdaznan. Apparently, uh, it was recommended to him by his friend Georg Mucher, who had introduced it to him. Georg Mucher, as some of you know, would join the Bauhaus uh, a year later in 1920. It had been founded in the United States by a man who had called himself Dr. Ottoman Tsar Adusht Ha Anish. He claimed to have revived an old 6th century Persian religion called Mazdakism. Mazda and Snan translates from Farsi as master thought. Emphasis in this religion was on breathing exercises, vegetarian diets with much garlic to make the raw vegetable palpable. And uh, um, um, actually, here are some notes uh, by uh, uh, Itten uh, that, you, uh, that describe the uh, uh, practice. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see breathe out uh, while you pull your belly in and stand straight. Reminds me a little bit of the thin air here in Aspen. We all have to, those who live in lower uh, areas have to breathe in a lot here to uh, uh, move along. But anyway, he uh, uh, claimed, Ottomar Tsar Adush Ta'anish, claimed that he was born in 1844 to a Russian diplomat in Tehran, have been sent as a child to a secret society of Zarathustrians in the Iran mountains due to his ser uh, serious congenital heart defect, which he overcame with the breathing techniques he learned there. In reality, Dr. Ottoman Tsar Adush Ta'anish was a German immigrant called Otto Hanisch who had settled in Mendota, Illinois and drifted from pursuit to pursuit, including sheep herding, typesetting, I have a photo here, um, typesetting, uh, mesmerism, spiritualism, and religion to religion. We know this from a believable source, the American writer, social critic, and journalist Upton Sinclair. He wrote a book in 1918 uh, on organized religion uh, before World War I called The Prophets of Religion. He devotes one chapter to Masnas Nan in this sub chapter called Book Six, The Church of the Quacks. Itten <laughs> asked his students to also shave their hands as he did, wear the same crimson robes and he had that he had designed, perform glandular exercises and a practice called colonic irrigation. Itten refused to teach in the main Bauhaus building by Henry van der Felde and looked for a different location. He found the perfect spot, a short walk away in the vast nearby park where Goethe had his summer house was this structure, the so-called Tempelherrenhaus in 18th century. Oh, sorry. These are some of uh, Itten's paintings, uh, some abstract, some very uh, sort of uh, uh, represented, uh, representative. This is his little son that was born, and he holds the Master's Nan sign in his hand. Um, Here's the Templerin house where uh, Itten taught his students. Uh, it had started out as an orange, uh, orangerie and greenhouse and then became a concert house and then a sort of Gothic temple as a folly in this park uh, in uh, the early 19th century. And uh, um, Goethe had been involved in the redesign and Goethe himself being a Freemason uh, had helped to design this tower and you might uh, notice the pentagons at the pentagrams and the tracery above. Among Itten's students, by the way, was, of course, Herbert Beyer, this wonderful artistic polymath uh, who later, uh, of course, was to design the graphic appearance, the visual identity of the Bauhaus uh, uh, when the Bauhaus moved to Dessau. He made it very clear that he said it was very uh, um, uh, important to undo traditional concepts of art and uh, craft and education, since most of us had not received traditional training and or had received some traditional training and needed to overcome uh, these uh, uh, inhibitions. So it's really quite uh, interesting uh, to see what uh, Itten uh, did the most. You see here, design for a master's and temple. He was very engaged in uh, color analysis and taught students uh, a new sort of system of reading colors, colors in fact, directly related to personality traits. So there were blue persons and green and yellow persons. The primary colors were explored in sort of psychological uh, analyses. Uh, Itten was very, very important in the early years of the Bauhaus because he introduced the four course. This, as Bayer had just described, this sort of uh, uh, semester long trying to get rid of the overcome ideas of what art was about uh, and craft was about and rather, in fact, uh, uh, to, by very simple exercises about materials, color, and form, uh, get access to the essence of creating 
uh, art and, and life in general. So this four course, this introductory course, was in a way akin to the cleansing rituals that Itten prescribed to his students as well. It was sort of a mental uh, cleansing that he uh, uh, prescribes uh, to bring people back to the essentials of how to create beauty and uh, art. There's no question that Itten was a key person at the Bauhaus in his first years. Oskar Schlemmer would later write, Itten was the secret director. Itten was Gropius' first officer. With him, the Bauhaus stands or falls. Gropius is Itten. Only the letter says the former does. Itten is the reason that almost all, only painters were hired. In fact, uh, uh, he was the one uh, who suggested to hire Kandinsky and Klee. And many, as we heard yesterday, many painters were hired in those early years. So Itten had a great influence in many different ways. Uh, here's that uh, uh, diagram where he sort of analyzes people by their sort of uh, aura of uh, color that uh, he taught his, uh, his students to see. The, stu the school was in a very difficult situation uh, in those years. By the end of uh, 19, there was uh, lots of debates in the uh, uh, local papers about closing the Bauhaus because the results were not up to what people had expected. Gropius himself felt he needed more time so the students could develop more uh, art, and uh, it was very, very close to uh, him getting withdrawn, the funds that the government of the state had uh, uh, allowed him. He had to plead for more materials, for money, for coal, for heating, for lighting in the studios. Uh, it was a desperate situation in Germany. The whole uh, country, of course, was in terrible economic shape. Max Tedi, who was the uh, um, um, conventional uh, painter who had uh, been involved in hiring him at first and was still teaching there, gave up on Gropius and said, I don't think your students are learning enough, and uh, separated himself from the Bauhaus and reopened the art school that uh, uh, Gropius had uh, initially integrated together with 28 students. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it came to a head in early 1920 at Parliament in Thuringia, and Gropius was invited, was given the chance to go there and defend his school. Gropius was a brilliant speaker. He went there. And the mood turned around. He gave a wonderful uh, uh, rendering of what the school was going to achieve and what it was about very early on, where he had nothing to show for himself. And all the politicians changed their mind and gave him the money he needed to continue the school. And that was the most crucial moment in those early years, in uh, early 1920. And so the school uh, continued. Just talking about that year, as I come to a close of 1919, um, there are signs on the wall of uh, uh, dark times to come and the end of the Bauhaus. Mussolini in 1919 founds his uh, fascist uh, uh, party. Hitler joins the German uh, uh, Workers' Party that then gets renamed in National Socialist German uh, Workers' Party. And he discovered, uh, discovers the swastika for himself. This is a drawing by Adolf Hitler. And as you all know, the Bauhaus was then closed by the Nazis. And, uh, 1933. But there are also other wonderful, hopeful, uh, great things happening at the same moment uh, in Holland that the style movement has taken off in 1917. Uh, and you see here wonderful drawings by Van Duisburg, uh, who was the sort of spokesperson, comes to the Bauhaus in 22. Itten is kicked out, and Van Duisburg, in a way, brings in a lot of influence and uh, uh, um, brings us much closer to the Bauhaus that many of you are familiar with. Here's a great chair by Rietveld, 1919, not yet uh, painted in the primary colors. And uh, Hans-Peter Röhl, who did the Bauhaus uh, signet, did this hilarious portrait of Itten on the right, the naked guy with a little thistle, and Van Duisburg confronting each other at the Bauhaus in 1922. So whatever influences the school absorbed, and there were many, they were always inflected into something new, thanks to Gropius and many others at the school. The commitment to reforming not just an art education and art, but mankind itself. Thank you very much.